So we start chapter 3, which is about processes, okay? And the very first thing we start is to learn about the objectives of this chapter, okay? Uh, we will understand what is a process, okay? And we will describe the various features of processes, okay? The scheduling, creation, termination, communication of processes, okay? And then we will have the two points about inter-process communication. So one type of inter-process communication is using shared memory and the other one is message passing. Finally, we will describe about the client-server communication system. But today we are uh, only concerned with the first two points. These are important okay, for today and the next two points we will see later. So what is a process? You already know that the difference between a process and a program is that a process is something active and a pro program is passive. It means that you have installed a program in your computer system and it, it has many files but one of the files may be executable file. In Windows that is an exe file. So if you double click on it in Windows it will start running. And this running of a program is actually what creates a process. So the program is passive or inactive, it is stored on the hard disk. When you double click and st it starts execution, then it becomes a process. A process is a program in the RAM because it's important or in fact it's uh, a requirement of the operating system or the CPU that if you want to run a program, you must first bring it into the RAM. So how does a program execute in a RAM? Actually, the program is just stored in the RAM, but its execution takes place in the CPU. So a program consists of instructions, and the CPU executes those instructions one by one. So how do you start a program? You can have a mouse click, or maybe you type its command name, okay, and maybe some other ways to run a program. It's also possible that one program can have several processes. We will see how do that happen uh, in the later slides. So what's the concept of a process? It's a program in execution, but here in this diagram, we see how does a process look like in RAM. You can see here that it has four sections. First, let's, let's, understood, uh, let's understand that actually here, this is the starting address of the program, which we call zero. In the run, it can be anywhere, but for us, this is the starting address. And then it has some maximum limit. For example, one kilobyte, two megabyte, or maybe let's say uh, 500 megabyte, one gigabyte, whatever is the size, it will have some maximum size in the run. And this whole process is divided into four sections. The text, data, heap, and stack section. Now what is stack section? The text section is where actually you have the program code. So what is the program code? These are the instructions that are compiled into machine language when you actually uh, compile your own program in C, C++, or Java, or any other language. So this text section contains the code of the program which is going to be executed by the CPU. The next one is the data section. And the data section contains the global variables of a program. So what's the global variable? You should also know the difference of global variables from the local variables. The local variables are those which are inside a function, okay, which are only accessible to that function. So when you call a function, you pass some parameters, inside the function you have more variables and then the function returns. So all those parameters of function, those things which are... What we see here is actually the data section and the stack section. So stack contains the function parameters which you pass to a function, the local variables which are declared inside the function and the return type or the return addresses that's actually inside the stack and you should all already know about stack from your data structures course 
it is a last in first out data structure okay why last in first out is important here because if you are inside the main function okay and you go to another function from main then the new function will be on top of main and if you call a third function then that will be on top of the stack so when the third function is finished the stack top will be removed and you will go into a section a second function when the second function returns it means you remove from the top of the stack and you go back into the main so that's why we use a stack when you call from one function to another function now the stack and the data sections they contain variables whether they are a global or local one and the final one is the heap the heap section it contains that memory which you allocate dynamically during runtime so you create objects okay and you read files okay you save some data into memory in different forms you read some tables you read uh, let's say download some data from the internet it's in the memory so this is where the heap grows and we see here that the stack and the heap they are the things which grow dynamically the global variables they are defined during the compile time the code the the text section it is already are you hear me okay there was some mute so maybe some last sections you did not hear me i repeat that the stack and the heap they are growing why because the stack is created dynamically when you call one function or another function the heap it also grows because you may be having some data at the run time but the data and text they are fixed the text contain code which is fixed and the data contain global variables which is also fixed now this process which we have in memory you can see this diagram it's only for one process but suppose the operating system has thousands of processes like this and you know that a, a, the operating system it may need to switch from one process to another process because the operating system is running many processes at the same time like here in my example i'm running powerpoint i'm running browser maybe email client and other things at the same time so how does operating system manage that for that the operating system has a process control block which contains information about the process so every time operating system runs a process it gets the data from the process control block which means that it loads all the data which is stored or the important data which is stored in the process control block into the cpu its registers okay and other uh, data structures which are reported for the operating system to run that process and when the process uh, is removed from the cpu we will see the reason why is it removed okay so when the process is removed from the cpu it means that actually what you will see is this pcb it is stored into the ram okay and when you load a new process its pcb is reloaded from ram into the cpu the, the values of the, the pcb and i'm going to explain this uh, in the next few slides so here you can see how cpu switches from one process to another process you can see process p0 process p1 and the operating system so operating system is also a process inside the computer system and suppose initially the process p0 is executing this blue arrow it represents the execution of a process because of some reason there may be an interrupt or a system call okay which means that the cpu needs to be relieved by this process and the operating system will save the state of this process p0 into its pcb so pcb0 is about process p0 when the state of this process is saved this process can be removed the cpu can do whatever it wants maybe it is actually processing the interrupt or the system call and when that is finished maybe it's a turn of the process p1 suppose the process p1 starts executing for that actually before the execution you should know what process p1 was doing before so you reload the state of process p1 from its pcb which is pcb1 
what does it contain PCB1 it contains the state of the process it was before and now it's changed to running state the process number okay the program counter which means from where you start the execution of the instructions the values of the registers what are the limits of the memory the memory limits are important because if the process is a hacker's process some malicious process which is not a good process some harmful process maybe it tries to read the limits outside its memory which is not good actually so if it is trying to read something outside its memory limit it means that is doing some harm to the system so the operating system will only allow execution of those instructions or reading data from those uh, memory areas memory areas which are in this memory limits also the operating system knows which files are opened by this process and much more other information about CPU use etc IO status information and so on so what we learn here from this diagram is that when a process P0 is executing okay and because of some reason it needs to be relieved from the CPU so the operating system must save the state of this process into this PCB if any process is being loaded into the uh, CPU okay it's only possible because the CPU reloads the state from its PC and it starts executing when again this process is now stopped okay it is removed from the CPU so its state must be saved into its PCB now important thing here is that you can see this black line which is idle idle means this process is not doing anything why because it is waiting for something or maybe uh, it's waiting for its own turn it's waiting for IO okay or it has nothing to do because the user is not using it so that state is idle between this executing process P0 and the executing process P1 you can see that there is an area when both the processes they are idle it can be two reasons one reason is that the operating system is executing something else or the other reason is that it is the time during which the operating system is actually doing the context switch which means it is saving the context of this process and reloading the context of the other process this time of switching the context from one process to another process is known as the context switch time and it is considered as overhead which means that the CPU is doing something which is not useful for the user is there any question on this context then we need to understand the process state okay there are five process states as you can see here from these ovals the very first state is the new state from which the process moves to ready state from ready state the process can go to running state and from running state there are three possibilities going to be terminated going back to ready state or moving into the waiting state okay from waiting state you can only go to the ready state now why do these states exist and what do they mean and you can also see that when a process moves from one state to another state there is these labels which show the reason for moving from one state to another state now a new state is a state when you just start executing a process and the operating system is creating its data structure in the memory which means a PCB so it's loading its information about memory limits about data about code or text and the stack and heap all those things are being created this is called a new state then when its PCB is created and the process is loaded into the memory this is called admission of a process into RAM and the process is said to be in the ready state in ready state the process is actually not doing anything it is only waiting for its turn for its execution by the CPU and when it, it is turn of this process then the scheduler dispatches this process and it is in the running state Scheduler dispatch means the process is now in the CPU 
And as in the last slide, a process is in the CPU only when its PCB is loaded into the CPU, uh, uh, CPU by the operating system. Because of some reason, the process can change from running state into other three states. So one possibility is that the process is uh, exited and it becomes terminated. Why it's exited? Because it has finished its job or maybe the user just clicked on the exit button and the process is in uh, process went into terminated state. Another reason uh, for leaving the CPU from running state is to go into the read ready state which is possible because of some interrupt. An interrupt can happen because of uh, several reasons. It can be an interrupt of uh, from the operating system okay because the operating system says no uh, it's not your turn okay uh, because the operating system has to do some important stuff or maybe the process was running and its time is finished because every process has uh, to run for a maximum time before beyond that the process is not allowed and it has to switch the CPU so because of interrupt the process can move from running to ready state and the final way here is that the process is running and it needs some IO or it's waiting from the other process in that case it is leaving the CPU before its time slash expires okay its own time which the operating system has given it for you before its time it stops okay which means it goes into waiting state for some IO let's say it's waiting for keyboard input or it's reading some file from the hard disk or it's saving some file into the hard disk then it will be going from running to waiting state and one last transition is about the process which moves from waiting state to ready state it happens when this IO is completed so if the process was waiting for keyboard input it goes into waiting the user gives a keyboard input which means that the IO is completed so it will go back to ready state now waiting for its execution or similarly the process was waiting for a file to be loaded into RAM or a file to be saved and that job has been done so the process can now go back to ready state and waiting for the scheduler to dispatch it back into the CPU and then it will become into the running state so this is the explanation of five states of the process. Now I discussed about the aspect of going a process from ready state into running state, this one. This is done by the scheduler. So it will choose when this process can go from ready to running state. So when can this happen? Now, before understanding the process scheduling, we must understand one important principle of computing. When you use computer, our goal is to maximize CPU use, which means that the CPU must be kept busy as much as possible by the user or by the operating system actually. So the job of the operating system is that anytime it sees the CPU can be used, it will use the CPU. If a process is finished work, uh, working on its job or it's waiting for I.O., the CPU must switch to a new process, which will be running on the CPU. So, uh, in the last chapter, we discussed about time sharing. Time sharing means that one CPU is being shared by many users or many processes at the same time. It's possible only if actually the CPU has given a small time to each process and after that it switches to a new process. In this way it will switch from one process to another process and this will result in maximizing the use of CPU. But how does a process switch from one process to another process? Which process should come? Which process should go? When should the next process come? This is what we call as scheduling and this is done by uh, uh, an entity which is called a process scheduler. So imagine you have 10 programs in RAM which are running at the same time. So the job of the process scheduler is to load that process into RAM 
uh, sorry into CPU whose turn it is now and the selection of which process will come we will discuss this in the next chapter about how you select the process so for that purpose the operating system maintains scheduling queues or processes and there are three different queues we study here one is the job queue which means all processes in the system some processes they may be in the RAM some processes they may not be in the RAM because they have been sent to hard disk for temporary uh, suspension this is called a job queue the ready queue contains only those processes which are in the main memory and they want to be executed so when you create a new process it is put in the ready queue initially okay and from ready queue it uh, will go to the running state so in the ready queue it's waiting and it is sent or dispatched to the CPU by the process scheduler when it is its turn similarly we have queue for each type of device which contains those processes which are waiting for that device and the final point is that the processes they can move from one queue to another queue from ready queue to the job queue from job queue to the ready queue from ready queue to the device queues from device queue to the ready queue and so on the example of these queues is given in this diagram which shows five different types of queues so on top you can see the ready queue which means it contains those processes which are waiting for the CPU to be given to these processes you can see that this queue or in, in fact all of these queues they have been implemented as linked list which has a header and a tail the head points to the first one in the queue and the tail points to the last one in this ready queue there are only two processes okay the important thing here is to see that what you have in these queues is not the process but the representation of a process in the form of a PCB so it contains a pointer to the PCB of the process and the PCB contains the registers, IO etc all this information okay so you have this PCB for process 7 when you take it into the uh, you dispatch it to the CPU now the pointer of head will point to the PCB 2 and if there is another process and so on here we see that these two queues they are empty there is nothing no process is waiting for the magnetic tape and the head uh, of this process the queue for disk unit it is pointing to some PCB which is pointing to more PCBs so there are overall three processes where, which are waiting for the disk queues finally the terminal is uh, the terminal is your screen okay so it is actually having one process in its queue which is waiting for this terminal to be used now we know that the processes they move between uh, different queues so this queuing diagram shows how a process is scheduled and how a process moves from one state to another state from one queue to another queue or to the CPU and it also explains the reasons so initially a new process comes it is put into the ready queue when it is a turn of the process it is dispatched to the CPU if this process finishes then it goes back uh, and is terminated otherwise there are four different possibilities when it will leave the CPU okay and it will do something else the first possibility is that it needs either some input from keyboard some other device or maybe some output to the hard disk or some other device so if it, there is an input output request it will be removed from the CPU and it will go into the IO queue for that device when the IO is finished okay it doesn't need any more input output so it will be put back into the ready queue that is one possibility of IO request another possibility in which case the CPU is removed the process is removed from the CPU is that the time slice for this process is expired which means that as I told you before each process has a specific time 
So when that time expires, the process is removed from the CPU and it is put back into the ready queue. And the next time its process turns come, it will go back to the CPU. Similarly, the CPU can fork a child, which means it will create a child and the child will start executing and then this process will actually go into the ready queue and if there is some interrupt the process is waiting okay the process will go wait for the interrupt okay and then after the interrupt occurs it will go into the ready queue yes for what sorry Fork and child, yes, it will come. It will come. Yes, good question. When do we use fork? When do we use child? Uh, it will come. In fact, I think we discussed it in the last uh, chapter two also. But briefly, if it does not come uh, in the few slides, I will I will tell you here. This what happens is that let's say you are executing uh, Microsoft Word. Okay. Now Microsoft Word, you are typing something and when you finish typing you want to print your file okay so what you do you click on file and print and you see a print dialog now this print dialog comes from the printer process it is a new process which is created by microsoft word so microsoft word will create a process for printing and when you select the parameters on the printing dialog box and you click ok so this print child it will start executing okay as a different process okay and when this process is not finished maybe microsoft word is waiting for it okay so this form is actually a new process which is created by the uh, printer uh, the the word program to print a file similarly the example of chrome browser that we will see uh, after some time in a few slides that whenever you uh, create a new tab actually it creates a process okay a new process so the browser which is the parent it creates many children processes which are the tabs inside this process and I will explain it there again okay so what I discussed before about scheduling was the short term scheduler okay or the seeking scheduler which is only one of the three schedulers the short term scheduler, why is it called short term? Because it will create a process for very short term for CPU and this term will be only the time during which this process will be executed on the CPU. After that, the process will be removed. Okay? So the scheduler, which is short term scheduler, which selects the CPU, we will discuss in the next chapter okay, about uh, process scheduling. Okay, how does this scheduling work? But we should understand here is that this is one type of scheduler which sends a process or which dispatches a process to the CPU. This scheduler must be very fast because it is in, uh, invoked or it is called very frequently, sometimes in milliseconds or even in microseconds. Okay, so it must be very fast, very quick, and it must be very short to take the decision. The next one is the long term scheduler. Okay? The long term scheduler is the one which decides which processes should be brought into the ready queue for main memory. Okay? Some processes they are not in the main memory, they are in the hard disk and that we will explain next. But the processes which are in main memory these are decided by the long term scheduler. Now the long term scheduler controls the degree of multi-programming it means it is on the decision of the long-term schedulers how many programs should be executed at the same time or how many programs should be allowed at the same time in the RAM okay so the more program you allow the higher the degree of multi-programming the long-term scheduler is actually not as uh, fast as the short-term scheduler okay because uh, it is working on a long term time and it might be working in seconds or minutes not in milliseconds or microseconds just like short term scheduler okay 
Then we discuss uh, also here that the process can be described as IO bond process or CPU bond process. An IO bond process is one which is doing more IO than the computations, which means that it uses CPU for very little time. Okay, there may be many usage of CPU, but for very short time. Most of the time, it is doing IO, reading some files loading some files, downloading something, something uh, sending or uploading something on the internet, etc. So these are IO bound processes. Then the CPU bound process is one which spends most of its time doing some computation. Okay? So it has long CPU bursts. A CPU burst means for how long the, uh, you are using uh, the CPU, the time during which you use CPU. So one CPU burst may be long or short depending upon the type of process. A CPU bound process has long CPU burst and an IO bound process has a short CPU burst. But there may be many short CPU bursts in IO bound and there will be few long CPU bursts in the CPU bound. So the objective of uh, the long term scheduler is to have a good process mix which means a mix of IO bound and CPU bound. If all the processes are IO bound, then the CPU maximization will be not good. If all processes are CPU bound, then again the process uh, will have to wait, every process has to wait for a long time before it can get to CPU. So we will study these things uh, in the next chapter about how to have a good scheduler. One more scheduler that we add into a system is that of the medium term scheduler. What is a medium term scheduler? It is a scheduler which decides when a program should be actually in the memory, main memory or when it should be taken to the hard disk. Why do we take a program in the hard disk? Because sometimes you have limited RAM but the number of programs is large or maybe there are few programs but each program is very large in size so you cannot put the whole program or all the programs in the RAM so you take back part of the program or some of the programs from RAM into the hard disk these are actually processes in the RAM but you take them to a temporary location into the hard disk which acts as a RAM. Okay, we will study this in the next chapter, but briefly, this process is called swapping. When you take a process from RAM into the hard disk, this is called swapping out, and when you bring back a process in the hard disk into the RAM, this is called swapping in. Okay, so we will see this in virtual memory management chapter. Now these are some animations that you can see okay, uh, to understand the concept of processes and to understand the uh, concept of scheduling of processes. Now here we take a small break and we will resume after a few minutes. So if you have any question you can ask me after the break. Okay, so let's start again after the break. Before the break we studied about the general idea of process scheduling. Do you hear me? Okay, so please uh, stop talking and let's start. Okay, now we understand the idea of context switch. Okay, I have explained this before in several slides, but here uh, the slide says that when the CPU switches from one process to another process, this is called a context switch. And in the context switch, what happens is that the CPU it saves the context or the information about the process into the PCB because when the next time the same process is going to be executed again the CPU may need to know from where to start and what was the value of each register in the last run so it saves the state of the PCB uh, the, the CPU and all the registers into this PCB this is called a context save and then it loads the context of the process which is going to be executed next. Okay, 
So this loading and saving of context states, this results in the context switch. Now the context switch time is overhead, which means it is not a useful time for the operating system, for the application or for the user. But you have to manage this time. Ideally, the context switch time should be minimum so that the CPU can do useful things. If your operating system is complex, it means the PCB and the processes will be complex and it will take more time to load or save the PCB and that's, uh, that will result in actually the slow execution of processes. But it is also dependent on the hardware support. So modern CPUs, modern computer architecture, they have support for PCB and many other things which were not there in the previous architectures. Okay. So we know the notion of a process. We know about the process states. Okay. We know that a new process comes into new state, then it goes into ready state, then it goes into the uh, from ready it goes into running state and then it can go again into ready or IO waiting state or terminated state. Now we are going to discuss these things about process creation in detail. So how do you create a process normally? A process is created by some parent process. So when you double click a file, the parent process is your Windows operating system, the kernel process or the desktop process which creates that process which you double click. In Linux actually, when you run a command, so the command prompt or the shell is the parent process which creates a child process. Okay? So in this way, you have one process which creates another process that process can create yet another process and this can result in a tree of processes. Each process has its own process identifier which identifies that process in the system. So that PID is unique for the execution of uh, operating system when it starts until it boots then it will reset the process identifiers. Now, there are options when a parent creates a child, so there must be some resources, for example, some memory, some files, some data in the parent that might be needed by the child. So how do you share those resources? There are three options here. One option is that the parent and children, they share all resources. So whatever the parent has, the children have access to the same resources. The second option is that the children can share part of the parent's resources, not all of them. And the third one is that the parent and the child, they share no resources at all. They have their own set of resources. So which one we choose? It depends. Secondly, the execution options. Because you have now parent and uh, one or more children, so how do they execute? One option is that they both or they all, they execute concurrently at the same time. So parent is executing and the child is executing. And the second thing is that the parent, parent waits for the children to terminate and then you can terminate the parent. So this uh, creates different options. First we understand the tree of processes in Linux. Similar tree can happen in Windows as well. So here you can see that the very first process in the Linux system that is responsible for loading the rest of the process of the operating system and other parts of the kernel is the init process which has PID of 1. This init process, it can create another process such as kthreadd. Okay, this is a daemon. Okay, d means daemon, the last d. So it is a process which is running all the time in the background. It has a PID of 2 and this K3D can create other processes. Similarly, the init can create other processes like login, SSHD, etc. Okay, so this creates, uh, this results in a tree of processes. Now, before the break, someone asked about this fork and exec option. How and when do we use the fork? So I explained 
that maybe you have uh, I give two examples one example is that you have Microsoft Word you type something you want to print okay so the printer is actually another process which is created by the Word program okay and when you execute the printing process it will start printing into a printer and it will not depend on the word process so actually the word is the parent and the printer process is the child it is created using the fork command okay so the fork uh, the word will become parent it will be waiting from for the child which is the printer process when it executes it exits after that the word can also exit or do something else the process termination is uh, we have seen before that there are different options for process termination one is to use the exit system call okay so the exit system call is when the programmer explicitly wants to exit the process so it writes that in the code and when the user clicks on the exit button or issues some command like quit or exit in the program it will uh, result in calling the exit system call and the program will finish so if it is a system uh, sorry if it is a child so the child will return the status of the data to parent because the parent is using the wait command so the wait will receive the status of the child which means whether it executed successfully or it had some error when the process exits the operating system it removes or deallocates all the resources which were used by the process and these resources can be used by the other processes the parent can execute the abort system call for a child and that child can then be terminated why will parent do that there can be several reasons for example the child needs some resources let's say one megabyte uh, the parent or the operating system gives one megabyte but now the child is asking for more which is not possible so it must be uh, aborted or maybe the parent has a child but the child is no longer needed because a task is not required by the user so you need to abort the process and one other option is that because of whatever reasons the parent is going to exit okay and the operating system does not allow a child to continue after the parent exits so the child is also terminated these are different reasons for process termination one concept is cascading termination because you have a tree processes a tree of processes what happens if you want to create a parent which has some children and those children have some other children so it means that this is, there is grand, grandparent and grandchildren relation between different processes. So the operating system might not allow the children of a process if you kill a process. So in that case, when you kill a parent process, the parent process uh, will result in the killing of a children process, which will result in the killing of its grandchildren process. So all of these processes will be killed in the tree and this is called cascading termination which means the effect of one process will result in effect of uh, killing or terminating many other processes <coughs> so the wait I have already explained that the wait system call is waiting for a child and when the child terminates it re returns the status which is received by the parent okay then the, we have two uh, concepts of zombie and orphan okay if no parent is waiting okay for uh, a, for any child okay because it did not invoke the wait method so this process becomes zombie which means it is free nobody is waiting for it or if the parent is terminating okay it doesn't call wait so it is terminated the operating system does not know about this that the parent, the parent is, was waiting for someone so it terminates and then the process becomes orphan process okay so we need some methods to deal with zombie and orphan processes but that's not uh, in this course now we need to understand the multi-process architecture an example is from browser what is multi-process architecture 
In the beginning, I told you it's possible that you have one program, but several processes of the same program. And the good example is Chrome. So Chrome is one program, Chrome browser, okay? But whenever you run Chrome, it can happen that you open many tabs at one time. So each of the tab of the Chrome browser, it represents one process. Here you can see, these are the four tabs representing four processes, okay? But in addition to tabs, there are three main types of processes in tab. The browser process, it is responsible for creating the user interface, okay? And input output, whether it's related to disk or the network. So this is the browser process. Then there is the render process, which renders those tabs, okay, those web pages, it is responsible for HTML and JavaScript. Whenever you create a new tab, so it creates a new renderer process. And the render process is such that the browser does not allow the renderers to actually interact with other processes, other tabs, or with the disk or network I.O. Finally, there is process for each type of plugin. For example, a plugin can be a PDF plugin for reading PDF file. It can be an image reading plugin. It can be a Flash plugin. It can be a Java plugin or any other application which is not present in the browser, but it is used as a plugin to load that application or load that type of data. So three main types of processes exist in Chrome. The next topic, until now what we have done is understand the process creation, process termination and also if you have many processes. What happens if these processes they want to communicate with one another? This is called inter-process communication. The communication between processes. So why we need inter-process communication? We need to understand two types of process, processes with respect to communication. One type is the independent process, which is a process that does not need to communicate or cooperate with other processes. It does not depend on anything. It is executed in itself. You run it. It does its job. Then it terminates. That is an independent process. The other type of process is cooperating process, which actually may need to cooperate with other process because it may be needing some data from the other process or maybe it sends data to some other process. So in such a case, it is a dependent process or a cooperating process. Now these cooperating processes, they can affect other processes, they can change their state or they can be affected by the other processes their states can be changed, which means they can be uh, changed in terms of variables. The variables inside them, they can change. Or they can be changed in terms of the process states, such as moving from new, uh, moving from running to ready, or from running to I.O., or from I.O. to ready, etc. So these cooperating processes, how do they cooperate? For this, it's important that they are able to share their states or share information between them. So why do we use cooperating processes? What is the need? Maybe for information sharing. Okay, for example, uh, let's say you have this Word file and you want to print it. So how does the printer know about the content of the Word file? It's only possible if the Word process can share information to the printer file. And that information is about the document itself, the structure of the documents, what's inside the document. The exact form which you see on the screen should be seen on the printer as well. So this information sharing is one reason in which the, uh, for which uh, we can say that the processes they cooperate. The other reason can be computation speed up. So let's say one process has to do some task of uh, computing something, okay, uh, but it's only one process. If you divide it into two different processes and they do the same job at the same time on different CPUs, so it means that the computation will be performed quickly. Third thing is it helps in modularity. Uh, as we see the example of Chrome, 
it's better to have it in different processes so it's easy to manage and because if one process has problem it will not affect the other processes the final thing is about convenience of development and convenience of managing the process by the operating system convenience for programmer convenience for the operating system as well as convenience for the user when you have many processes running in the system so any question yes Actually, uh, I don't understand your question exactly, but let me repeat uh, that if you have one process and you create other processes, so the other processes, they become the children of the first process. Is that your question? Yes, when you create child, okay, so it means that you have more processes so the work of the parent can be divided into the children process so it's possible let's say in a family in the human family we have a mother and father and they have children so if the father is doing all the things only himself it will be difficult for him so he has children and he can divide the task between the children some children they maybe do house cleaning some they are going to do shopping some they are going to do cooking the wife is also doing something like okay so this is how you divide the task among yourself uh, is this your question or no i don't understand maybe your question very well modularity modularity means actually in programming this is a concept in programming when you divide programs into parts for ease of development and for management purpose for example instead of creating a very big program you divide into functions so that is the modularity or you have many objects instead of one big program this is the concept of modularity so in terms of processes you divide the task into different modules and each module become a process which runs uh, differently than the other processes that is called modularity okay dividing of one whole program into small parts whether they are functions whether they are processes whether they are objects okay so this results in good modularity of a program so because the processes they may need to collaborate with one another okay so this results in inter process communication okay and in general we have two possible types of inter process communication two methods in which the processes can communicate with one another one method is called message passing the other one is called shared memory and you can see these two figures they explain the idea very well so can anyone explain to me what's the difference between these two as you can see in this uh, these two images yes let me give you an example of shared memory let's say you are two friends or maybe two sisters they are living in one room so what do they share in that room yes for example they can share the cupboard okay they can share the things like there is a pen which is on the table you can use that pen and when you put it there your sister or your friend can use that pen okay every object in the room it is shared by two people or how as many people as they are in the room they can take the same object at any time one person may be using the object when he or she puts the object another person can use the object okay so that's same thing in the shared memory in ram there is area so here process a and process b they both can access the area so in that area what's there there may be variables or there may be functions function calls so when process a access a variable it changes the value of the variable later process b can come and it can see what's inside the variable and it can use the variable okay so that's shared memory what you can see here is that there is kernel okay in the system there are other processes and 
alongside processes there is some area of the RAM which is used by these two processes okay the other type which is message passing what you see here is that you have the concept of messages and a message queue so here we can see that the process A it has sent n messages into the queue and the process B it can retrieve the messages from queue one by one or it can also send some messages which can be received by process B process A or process B they can exchange messages through a message queue okay how do they work uh, we are going to see them in details in the next few slides both of them so the first one is about shared memory how does shared memory work you can see in this example that you have process P1 and process P2 they are in the RAM okay they have these four sections text data heap and stack okay so in the data section you can have a mapping from your data section into the shared memory what is meant by the mapping mapping means that when you access a part of data into your data section actually it will be somewhere in the RAM and uh, that will be accessed by your program so the same shared memory is also accessed by another process there is a mapping from that process to this shared memory okay and this mapping is actually possible with the help of pointers in C and C++ you have pointers so you can use pointers to access some memory location so when our one process changes something in the shared memory this, uh, the other process can have access to that and read the value of that changed value in this way they share information between them okay for sorry repeat nothing is between elite or what no look uh, the problem is I cannot hear you correctly because of the mic problem can you please repeat something M mapping okay mapping what is mapping between the shared memory and the process memory mapping means that actually uh, let me give you a real world example uh, for example let's say you have your telephone number okay in which uh, and your friend has also a telephone number so your friend has some name let's say Fatima and she has a telephone number so you don't remember her number but you know her name in your telephone when you call you don't type her number you type her name so what happens when you type Fatima in your phone you get her phone number and you can call so that's a mapping between your friend's name and her phone number you understand similarly in process p1 there is a mapping so if you call a variable let's say b in your uh, own shared memory let's say this is process p1 it has a variable b so there will be a mapping from the variable b to the location here so when it says b it will get data from here similarly another uh, process it will also have some variable when it calls a variable it will get access to the same memory let's say it also has variable b so they both will be referring to this location okay so mapping is just actually getting access to this area from your process you will be using variables in the main process but the data will come from this area which is in the RAM somewhere it can be anywhere in the RAM like here we can see it can be anywhere okay so this process will be accessing this area and process B will also be accessing the same area the other one is message passing you pass messages between two processes or more processes but an important thing here you can see is the distinction between kernel space and user space what you see here is that the application which is running in the user space it has a mapping to some area in the kernel space okay 
So whenever an application wants to send a message, the data in the user space is mapped to kernel space and the kernel or the operating system actually, it is creating a map so that both the process A and process B, they can access the same thing using messages. So how is it different from the uh, shared memory? The thing here is that there is the concept of sender and receiver. So the sender sends something and the receiver it receives that thing using message. Okay. So when you have some message, it is mapped to kernel space. The kernel it maps it to the receiver and from the receiver kernel space it is copied to the receiver's user space. So the receiver gets the same messages which were in the user space of this process into its own user space. Now for these, uh, this type of inter-process communication, the message passing, you have two operations, sending something and receiving something. You have these two operations, so the sender will use the send operation to send a message and the receiver will use the receive operation to receive a message. Okay, uh, I think we should stop here and in the next uh, lecture we will discuss, uh, we will revisit the concept of message passing. Any question?